Welcome to the New Life Behavior International video cast and podcast series. Presented by volunteer instructors, the New Life Behavior International series is presented in countries globally and in several on the African continent. Courses are available on nlbi.co.za and is absolutely free of charge. However, donations are welcome and completely voluntary. The core curriculum is a comprehensive study to discover a meaningful and personal relationship with God, with the objective to help individuals from all walks of life to be reconciled to God, reconciliation to families and society. The curriculum contains 174 lessons divided into 14 courses and is well received by both Christians and non-Christians alike. All the lessons are available on our website nlbi.co.za and you may communicate via email info at nlbi.co.za The outline of the curriculum is explained by volunteer instructor Oscar de Vries. These lessons will cover the following A sense of self A sense of family Parenting matters True freedom Christian marriage skills, Christian women, attitudes and behaviors, Christians against substance abuse, is a family net series, the seeker Bible study series, prisoners of Christ, managing my anger, Christians against sex addiction, managing my finance. In this way we say welcome to New Life Behavior Ministries. Dag luisteraars, goed om vir julle weer by ons te hee by New Life Behavior. It's wonderful to see everybody again for this lesson. I always enjoy just having a chat with you. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a lecturer. I'm just an ordinary person like you are. And uh, New Life Behavior is presenting these lessons with the intention that it may bring some benefit to you and to your family and people that are around you. And so if you want to uh, communicate with us besides this video cast, you are welcome to do on do so on nlbi.co.za, being the local website, or on nlbi.net. You can get all the information you want. You can download all of these lessons. You can study them in your own time, and you can communicate to the communication, the contact points that you you are given. And then also thanks to unlock radio.live who 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 are sharing in this experience and these video castings that we are busy with now we are in the second lesson today of course two called the sense of family and last time we we we, we we're dealing with the man at the moment the man in the family put it that way and please don't we're not uh, taking any particular view of, of uh, this is our opinion and that's our opinion. We're simply looking into the word of God and seeing what guidance it gives us in these uh, topics. Now, last time we had a look at saying that man is created in God's image. God has made us like him, we said, even in his emotions, with, with being rational logical uh, people and persons and individuals and also being God's stewards looking after his universe. Today we get to lesson number two on the Christian man and it's the lesson says the balancing act. Now what's this all about? Well what do you believe? That's the question. As to the way a Christian man behaves. Now remember, we we talk to all, all people, non-Christians, non-believers. We don't mind. You, you can take whatever you'd like from what we say here. But our benchmark 
our reference is the word of God. And so we need to say to ourselves, what do we believe about the way a Christian man behaves? Now, be careful that you don't see yourself just as a single one person. You see, we as men are rolled into one. But we comprise being fathers, husbands, employees, employers, citizens, taxpayers, voters, friends, religious people, club people, uh, athletes. You, you can make the list, but we're all rolled up into one person. And that means we are expected to act in certain ways in at certain times. That's the important thing. And as we act in our different roles, we make ourselves into complete and mature individuals. Now, a lot of people balance all of these things without thought. But in some roles that are so contrary that they actually create stress and tension. Now, just an example of this, just, just one simple single example. You see, we've got a world in which the father figure may be away for long periods of time. And how, how does this impact a, a, a family? We think about the balancing act. Well, first of all, he's not home often, circumstantially which means there's not a lot of intimacy in the marriage itself. As a father, he perhaps doesn't know his children, or he has less or little positive relationship with them. And the children often resent the fact of their absent father. He's gone, then all of a sudden he comes back again. Then we adjust and we readjust, and they see the father maybe even as abandoning them. Now we say a, a man has many roles, but let's just look at the individual. In other words, before a man can have a stable relationship with others, he must be complete, he needs to be mature in himself. He must be secure in his relationship. And, and then we ask the question, how do we, how do you and I, how do we see ourselves? How do we see ourselves? That is the foundation of all other relationships. Now, just to use Adam as an example here. Adam uh, was a complete mature individual when God created him. That we know. But when Adam decided that he wanted to be like God, you know, when the serpent came along and said, if you eat of this fruit of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, he says, Man, you're going to be like God. You're going to think like God. That's who you're going to be. And in that, he really rejects his own basic man. In other words, the result of this is where he didn't understand the difference between good and evil. This act helped him to understand the difference between or the idea of good and evil. And then we ask ourselves, was it, was it worth the price? Well, definitely not. He lost his intimate relationship with God. The same, I think, goes for Eve, but we're dealing with the men at this stage. It says in the beginning, even he lived in harmony with all the animals. And it seems that all of that has gone as well. You see, men, and in fact, this is the tragedy. Men have lived with this loss of relationship now, actually for so long, that we think it's quite natural. We think it's quite natural. We see today, experience today, it's natural. And it's not. It really isn't. It is unnatural that God did not intend for us to live a life of corruption and exclusion from him. He didn't want us to live, have to live that kind of life. But we can regain some of this. And this again comes to the message of new life when it says we can come to regain some of this 
in the sense when we turn to Jesus Christ. We all know John 3.16, don't we? Know? Don't we? God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but they shall have eternal life. And the very next verse, verse 17, we just skip over it, forget it. It says that God did not come to condemn us. It says that God came to redeem us. And redemption means he's come and he came to buy us back. How did he do that? He did it on the cross. I just want to talk a little bit about Job. We all know the book of Job. He's a good example of the secure, mature um, man that went wrong. Now, Satan challenged God and said, hmm, I'll sort him out. I can sort him out. And Satan causes Job to suffer one disaster after another. And in fact, Job's faith and trust in God gave way to self-pity and blaming God for his problems. That's where it went. Now the question is, don't we actually do the same things? When our lives take a turn for the worst, we say, nah. you see, when things are going well, we praise God for taking care of us. And that's good. That's positive, that we recognize that. But when things start to get sour and go the wrong way, then get, we get to self-pity and we say to God, why? Why? Why me, Lord? Do we get mad at God? Do we reject him? Or do you accept that because we live in an even, evil and a fallen world, bad things happen to good people? And we've got to deal with the temporal things versus the eternal things. And they, we, we, there are many books that said, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, we're living in an evil world. We're living in a world of nearly, if not already, 8 billion people. And I think it's just logic that bad things happen to good people. And we've got to ask ourselves, how many times have we blamed God for the consequences of our own irresponsible conduct. And we're talking about irresponsible conduct. But Job's only reply was, I'm sorry, Lord, for being arrogant. Isn't that a beautiful word? It's a bad word. He said, I'm sorry for being arrogant. And then not knowing what I'm talking about. And that's also a very, very important thing. Sometimes when we see God in the wrong light, we don't know what we're talking about. And then he says, Lord, forgive me. Now, it is painful, but we must take responsibility for our own behavior. The book of Ezekiel says, no, 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 you carry your own sin. It has impact always collateral damage. There's always impact, and that's why he talks about the 10 generations of that. But it impacts what you do, impacts other people, the ripple effect, if you want to call it. But each of us are responsible for our own beliefs and our own behavior. Whether we like it or not, it comes back to that. Now, we, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but for the moment, let's say that. You see, we need to be like Job. We need to recognize, as he did, his error, and he was man enough to admit it. So let's now stop at, or, 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 yeah, stop at, at Jesus. You see, Jesus is our supreme example of a secure, mature, and complete man. And if we look at Jesus' life, he could communicate at all levels of society. In other words, whether he was dealing with government officials like Nicodemus or the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, it says to him, they were all the same. Isn't that wonderful? He said they were all the same. People who were lost, people 
who were in need of a savior. And the message to G of Jesus to all of them was exactly the same. Repent and turn to God. When we look at Jesus, the man, with a capital M, it says, we do not seek a weak, effeminate person often portrayed in paintings. We see a person who was physically strong. He grew up in the shed or, or, or the workshop of a carpenter. He, he walked throughout Israel, the Western Bank, Jordan and Lebanon. He walked. That's the way he went. He spent nights outdoors. He stayed up for several days at a time. And he was scourged by Roman soldiers. And scourging was so bad that it could beat you into an inch of your life, as we would say. And scourging usually continued until the person died or the person was unconscious. And yet, despite all of that, we still find him trying to carry his cross, carry his cross for his crucifixion. You see, he was courageous. Jesus was a courageous man. Jesus stood up to his enemies when they attacked him. Even the religious, political enemies, he stood up to them. He censured them. He did not pout. He didn't whine. He didn't feel sorry for himself, perhaps like Job did. When he went into the temple and he saw people desecrating the temple as merchants, he, he actually physically chased them out of the temple. And then they asked him, who do you think you are? And he said, he told them that he was God. You know, how can you act like this? How can you think like this? He says, because I am God. You know, Pilate even said to Jesus, look, look, I tell you how we do this. You just play along and it'll all be fine. And he refused. Jesus organized the need for civil government when he said, give Caesar what Caesar's and give to God what is God. You see, we see, we see Jesus in the full range of things. We see him grieve, we see him sad, we see him angry, we see him loving, caring, fearful, and courageous. And we, when we look at the total picture of Jesus, we see one totally, one totally secure in his relationship with God and man. We see an obedient son of both God and Mary and Joseph and a close friend, a respected citizen, a highly effective teacher, an adored religious leader. And he, is, he reflects to us the embodiment of a real man. You see, when you see Jesus as the model of manhood, imagine what changes can take place in your life. Imagine, imagine. But then also let's go on to Jesus as being the social, or man, in fact, being the social being, which Jesus was. You see, we, live, we all live in some form of society. We have the desire to be around others, to feel needed, to love and to be loved. That's man, everybody. And we need some form of relationship with other people. And I want to say this, and this has obviously become a sensitive point, hasn't it? When I say that a man can have a relationship with another man, and I'm not talking about what we think may be in your mind, I'm talking about a true friendship, not a relationship between a man and a man and a woman and a woman, but we're talking about a true friendship here. You see, it's frowned upon in our modern society, in a sense, if men become what is called intimate friends. And there's no better example in God's word of a friendship than David and Jonathan. 
Jonathan, uh, David was married to Jonathan's sister, Michal. And they had similar interests, both of them, David and Jonathan. And they were both involved in the national politics of their country. And their friendship lasted many, many years. And they made a, a vow of friendship and of unfailing kindness, as the Bible will tell us, the word of God. They made a covenant that they would love each other. And you know, the beautiful part of that story is how they cared for each other. Because Jonathan's father wanted to kill David. And the story, if you go and have a look at 1 Samuel chapter 20, you can read it. And 2 Samuel chapter 1 is the story how Jonathan knew that dad was after David. And how they worked with signals and that to say, look, we can stay together if, if, if Saul is in his right mind. But if we, he's not, then we have to part our ways. That's what First Samuel, Second Samuel, chapter one is about. When they, when Jonathan warned David and said, "David, you're going to have to go. You're going to have to run. There's nothing I can do about it, but we will make a covenant with each other. We will love each other until our dying days." Let's just talk about the man. The in, we talked about the individual, etc. Now let's get to government. We always wonder, well, should, you know, is it right or wrong? for men to be active in governing their nation. Well, we can look at the whole word of God, which I'm not going to do today, except to say to you that many of the great characters and people written about in the word of God were involved in governing their nations because that's part of the balancing act, isn't it? That we also can engage, we can respect we can support governments ordained by God. We can act in a way that we protect and care. We can pray for our governments. We can try to influence the governments in a moral and ethical way. We might not can make a difference, but we need to believe that we can make a difference. And let's just touch briefly on this balancing act about man, the worker. And this is something that can get out of balance for many of us. For many of us. It says, what we work is what we do, not what we are. Work is something we do. Why do we work? What's, what's the biblical view? The word of God says, we work to provide for our families food, clothing, shelter, and the other things that go into our families in a very normal way. And the word of God is fair, because in the book of Thessalonians, it says in uh, um, first, second Thessalonians, sorry, uh, chapter three, it says, if you don't work, neither should you eat. And what's the balancing act in society? Well, this is uh, society is sort of an umbrella concept that includes all of man's relations, whether it's family or government, friends, school, church, business, people in the street, down to people in the street. It says, what is, what is the basis of our relationship? What is the balancing act? Yeah, the balancing point or factor. And it really comes from Matthew chapter 7. It says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That should be our principle, to try and in all of this to do to others as we would do, uh, they, we wish they would do for us or to us. I think it comes down to a word called respect. It's the word that we need to respect every individual in this world, no matter what the circumstances are. You don't treat somebody who you feel is of lower category in a disrespectful way. Treat people with respect. 
and you will gain their respect in return. We're going to talk about family relationships a bit later, so we'll skip over that one. And man is, we need to say that man is both an individual, but he's also a social being. And we need to keep the, our different parts uh, by trying to be in balance. And, and it's not easy. I absolutely say that it is not easy. It's in fact a lot of work. But we need to try and keep ourselves balanced in all of these roles. And the only place we can really go at the end of the day is to God. You know, as Matthew 19, as we close the day in verse 26 says, God is our helper. With God, all things are possible. And we must never think we are at a point in our lives where we're just, we can, we can do nothing. We, we, there's nothing we can do. Let's never give in to that. Let's never tell ourselves that there's nothing we can do. You might need a friend to help you. You might need somebody else to help you and work together. But the fact is, don't believe that there's nothing that we can do. I know we always go to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13 and says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And I'm very careful to use that scripture because it talks about Paul and his life. It was an incredibly, incredibly challenging and difficult life. And at the end of it, he says, I know, that's what he's saying, I can do all things in Christ. Let's close today with the word of prayer. Father, we men have a tremendous challenge in this world. And sometimes we find ourselves wanting, Father, because we haven't got the balance right. Life has taken us and skewed us in a way. And we struggle, Father, circumstantially as we find ourselves in the world and as we see the world changing in our right in front of us, Father. At times, sometimes we, we're struggling. We're back. But let us know that you want to live within us. You want to be in us. But Father, we need to be in you. We need to come to you. We need to give ourselves, repent, confess, be baptized to be walked, to be raised, to walk in a new life and a new path and become a new creation. Help us, Father, in our struggles, when we're thinking about it, when we're not thinking about it. Help us, Father, just to realize that most of all, you are there. You're happy to listen to us. You're happy to help us if we help ourselves, Father. So bless us and be with us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now just a few little easy tips. First of all, each lesson is going to ask you to note a few personal thoughts about the question that is asked. And then read the questions at the end of the lesson, but do not attempt to answer them. Then study or read the lesson. Then answer the questions and then give yourself the opportunity to write some personal reflections. And you are more than welcome to send your answers and questions to info at nlbi.co.za